get started, some of you standing in the back, please take a seat. Um, well, good evening. I'm Stephanie Maris. I'm director of the Entrepreneurship Center here at UCSF, and uh, very pleased to see a good crowd tonight for our very special evening, our Startup 101 Pitch Night. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do here and um, about the class, Startup 101, and then we will be hearing from our student teams. We have a great panel of judges who I'll introduce and uh, reception afterwards, so I welcome you all to stick around and get a chance to mingle uh, afterwards with these great teams. I run the Entrepreneurship Center here at UCSF, and our mission is to start companies, hopefully from UCSF technology, at least with UCSF members. And we also want to give people the experience of a startup, of entrepreneurship. And uh, this is a great way to do that. It's a very intense, short course that lets people know what it's like to be an entrepreneur, which is something very different than most people at UCSF have done. We've created a number of different programs to help educate people and build an ecosystem and bring in the business community, all of which are so important for uh, a good startup environment. So we have a number of events through a speakers series, an entrepreneurs club, and mixers, a startup connection, all sorts of vehicles to bring people together. And then sort of at the center of this is our courses and workshops. And Startup 101 is our crown jewel course. It's the one that we find is most likely to create new ventures. And then when you get out of Startup 101 and you're serious, you may decide you want more, and then you can be part of our pre-accelerator group, which is um, a founders group, special mentoring, uh, in investment introductions, a chance to pitch at different kinds of competitions and conferences. So we try to take care of you if you're serious and help you along the way. So the plan was to build a startup ecosystem here, and that means we have to go outside our walls because we are a fabulous community of scientists and clinicians, but that's narrow in terms of doing startups. So we wanted to bring in the outside world, Berkeley and Stanford, our academic colleagues, and Silicon Valley, we're so fortunate to be here in the center of the world for startups. And then the business community, the angel investment community, and the venture capital community. And through these various vehicles, we've been able to bring these people together and, and have them create a vibrant ecosystem. There's a lot of strength from diversity of experience. So we wanted to make sure that our community here at UCSF gets to experience investors, business people, uh, entrepreneurs, and then other scientists clinicians, and mix it all up, because that's going to produce the strongest results. We reach across everything at UCSF, so um, we are in every area that UCSF is in. We touch clinicians, we touch scientists, we touch postdocs, we touch faculty, and you can have an idea in any sector of the life science healthcare world. So it doesn't matter whether you've got a digital health idea, a diagnostic idea, therapeutics, devices, et cetera. They're all things that we can help you with. So a little bit about our results. I'm very pleased that we're able to compete globally. Uh, this is Thaddeus Allen. He started an oncology company called Tradewind Bioscience coming out of a lab here at UCSF. And this, he is pitching at Y Combinator, which is arguably the world's uh, most famous accelerator here in Silicon Valley. It's very hard to get in. In fact, their acceptance rate is something like 2%, which they're happy to say is lower than Harvard and Stanford. Mm -hmm. And um, Thaddeus got in, and this, this is him on stage. So we are involved with a number of different accelerators here, and that's a great next step for people who come out of this class. Our startups are getting funded. Over the four-year period, we had 20 companies that we've touched at the Entrepreneurship Center raise a total of $59 million. So, of course, that's the next step. Some companies are further along than others, but we're having success now that we've taught people to think about the business and the way that investors think. 
We have a great advisory board and um, happy to welcome George Skangos, who's here tonight. George, you want to wave? <laughs> Thank you. George and I have known each other for a long time. And when I first did the slide, he was CEO of Biogen, and now he's CEO of a hot startup called Veer. And I don't know if Reg Kelly's in the room. Um, Reg, are you here yet? Uh, but he is also on the advisory board. So we are happy to be surrounded by really good people. OK, uh, I next would like to welcome Dan Lowenstein, who I see in the back there. Dan is our executive vice chancellor and provost of UCSF. He has um, an MD from Harvard and is a, um, uh, a researcher himself. And he's been a great supporter of entrepreneurship and specifically the Entrepreneurship Center. So Dan, please welcome everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. And welcome, everyone, uh, to UCSF. Recently, in clinic, a 29-year-old woman came to seek my advice regarding an event that happened. And to make a long clinical history short, it was very clear that she had just experienced a few weeks previously her first time generalized tonic-clonic seizure. A mother of a couple children, married, uh, and suddenly her life was completely upended by the fact that this event occurred um, without any warning. And as it turns out through the workup, it was immediately clear that she had the diagnosis of epilepsy, meaning that she had a high risk of recurrent seizures. And so the fairly typical story, and uh, given the background that we have in the Epilepsy Center, it was fairly straightforward what we needed to do. But what's striking about this patient is that she came in asking what I call the three universal questions that we all ask when we seek the advice of a healer. And those questions are, why did this happen to me? Can you help me? And what does my future hold? Now, I want you to just step away from what you normally do in life whether you're an entrepreneur, a postdoc, a research scientist, a faculty member, whatever. Just step away from that for a moment and just think about your own personal experience of seeking the help of a healer or for one of your loved ones in your family, right? Aren't those the questions you ask? Why did this happen to me? Can you help me? What does my future hold, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't take out the energy to go and see a healer if you didn't have at least a couple of those questions in your mind, right? It turns out that in 2018, for the patient that I just described, I can barely answer any of those questions. Why did this happen? I have actually no idea why this particular 29-year-old woman had her first time generalized tonic-clonic seizure. I have some theories. Could well be genetic of some sort, but I have no idea what gene it is. It's probably not acquired, and so forth. Can you help me? Well, absolutely, we're here to try and help you. But in terms of which drug to use for someone with a first-time seizure, in the vast majority of the cases, we actually truly have no idea. It's a guess, an educated guess. And will the drug have any side effects? Likely, yes, but I can't predict which ones. And finally, what does my future hold? At the moment, we have no biomarkers for epilepsy. I have no way of predicting whether or not this patient will have another seizure, whether she'll ever be able to drive again, whether her disease course will make things worse, whether it'll ever go away. OK, so that's like the nadir of my comments. OK, everything else, hopefully. The, the reason that I want to point this out is you can substitute in hundreds of disease names for the situation that I just described, right? And I see people nodding and agreeing. This is why we're all doing what we're doing. The work that goes on in the Entrepreneurship Center is part of the ecosystem that we're all involved in here. And I can speak, I can sort of speak only for UCSF, but I know this applies to so many other entities out there, the other institutions, the other universities, the other businesses, the companies, the startups, the biotech. We're all in this for the same reason. We want to lessen 
the suffering that exists in the world. That's what this is all about. And the, the story that I just described is just one example of the ongoing suffering that we all know of firsthand through our own life experience or, or through the people that we love. Everybody knows about this. And that's what drives the passion at a place like UCSF. So as one of, one of many leaders here, I just want to convey to you how passionate we are about the work that all of us have to do to lessen the suffering in the world. And that's the reason why you're doing the work that you're doing. And we are proud of it. We want to support you. And we're, we're so proud of the work that Stephanie has been doing because the Entrepreneurship Center has really become sort of the core, the core center of you know, how it is that we translate the incredible work that's going on at the bench and make it actually something available to the patient who walks into our clinic. So I want to uh, congratulate you for the success of the EC. Um, Startup 101 has been one of our great successes at UCSF over the last number of years. I really appreciate the support that's come from a whole host of members of the team behind Stephanie. And for those of you who are pitching tonight, best of luck. We want to see some more startup companies. So thank you. I'm really looking forward to the presentation. That's great. Thank you. You're lucky I am to work with a guy like Dan. Wow. OK. So let me tell you a little bit about this class and uh, what it's all about. So why we do this? We want people to experience what it's like to be on a startup team and to be able to test out their ideas and learn the business side of commercializing a venture. This is an experiential course. It's the way things are taught at Stanford, at Berkeley, in Silicon Valley, and, and more and more around the world. You come in on a team, and then you experience enough stress that we put on you in class that it feels kind of like a startup environment. You maybe have never had deadlines like this before or had to uh, be responsible to a number of other people. So that's experiential. During this class, you create a, vi a business plan, and our goal is to start scalable, high-potential ventures. So we are looking to start a venture that can change human health care. Um, we, we're looking, we think big, and this is a class in which you can think big. And then we learn a lot about what investors require. So it's kind of a black box when people walk in. It's like an investor, well, you know, I'll just go to venture capital and ask for $30 million and, you know, I could get my gene therapy thing going. It doesn't work that way, and I think uh, the class has learned that in the 11 weeks we've been together. So it's really important. If you want to get your, your venture funded, you need to understand the requirements of an investor. The demographic is pretty interesting. Intentionally, we've opened this class to include people beyond UCSF. And you can see that we're about half UCSF and half everything else. And the everything else includes alumni from Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford, the business community, people who are actually working on startups currently, um, th the joint programs between UCSF and Berkeley, like MTM, Masters in Translational Ma Management, and Berkeley. So a nice mix, exactly what we were hoping to get. Our class is largely postdocs because they often work with faculty members who have great ideas but say they're not going to leave UCSF, but hey, Mr. Postdoc or Ms. Postdoc, you know, if you want to take this and run with it, we'd love to have you do it. So we have a lot of postdocs. This year we've had more faculty than ever before, which is great. And we also have clinicians, which are really tough to get because they have such a crazy schedule. And then a, a bunch of other things, PhD students and scientists and people in companies and so on. What I always find fascinating is how many people are really serious about doing a startup. This year, it's 57% said they're very serious about doing a startup. This is the uh, evaluation form we did after the class. And then there's another 39% that said they're not sure, so they haven't ruled it out. So it's really only a very small percent that said, nah, I don't want this. It's just, you know, too much of a hassle. So this is really encouraging. This says we are building an entrepreneurial ecosystem here that matters. And also very interesting is if you add up the people working on their own startup or in someone else's startup, you come up with 64%. 64%, two-thirds of them were already working on startups before they came in. 
So uh, there are very few who are just sort of vaguely curious. People are pretty serious in this class. We have a great advisory committee. I know there are a couple of members here. Tanya, you want to wave? Someplace Tanya Fernandez, who represents therapeutics. Any other advisory? Chris, Chris Maida, someplace. Uh, around in the back is uh, diagnostics. So we've recruited people from different sectors of life science who could provide that very special lens for their particular expertise, and the class benefits from that. Our experienced mentors are a key resource, and we're so fortunate. We had 17 teams and 29 mentor mentors. We had people saying, please find me a team. I really want to be a mentor this year. So I want to recognize all the mentors who've devoted someplace between one and two hours per week or more working with their teams. Uh, this is one of the most important elements of, of being able to be successful in a startup. So mentors, could you stand? The mentors who are here, we'd love to give you a round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you. So what did we cover in the syllabus? Well, we did sort of all of the traditional entrepreneurship topics, entre opportunity recognition, customer discovery, business planning and models. I'll let you glance at this. But basically, we covered in an evening sort of the key things that you need to know to put together a plan that's uh, commercializable. And we did that with a lot of guest lecturers. So we bring people in from the business community and the investment community to, to, and the legal community to tell people what it's really like out there. This is not an academic course. This is a course that's very real, very real time with experts who are out there doing this stuff all the time. And I know we have some members, some of our guest lecturers here. Um, I saw Todd Esker someplace, Todd. You're in the room someplace. Um, anyway, we are very happy to ha be able to tap into this incredible a group of people in Silicon Valley who are happy to come to UCSF and, and participate with us. So the deliverables in the class were 20 or more customer discovery interviews. Those are interviews with the market to understand, hey, is this thing that I think is the world's best idea ever have any appeal to the marketplace? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to pay for it? So that's a really important part of this class. They also had to all write an executive summary, two to three pages. We don't write business plans anymore in Silicon Valley. That's passe. So executive summary and pitch deck, those are the deliverables. Not every team could come tonight because we didn't want to keep you here till midnight. So since we had 17 teams, we held a competition a week ago and winnowed it down to 10. And you're actually going to see 10 and a half because you have a special situation, which I'll tell you about soon. Um, there is a prize for the top team. So the top two teams um, are going to have exposure to angels based on what the judges decide tonight. Life Science Angels is providing us with an opportunity to go in front of a screening committee. And that's something that is not very easy to get. It takes you one step down the path to actually getting into pitch to Life Science Angels. So that will be the number one place winner will we'll get this prize. And Band of Angels, uh, another angel group that invests in life science, is going to have both first and second place winners come to their special mentor day. So this is a great, um, a, a great uh, incentive for teams to do especially well today because you get some good angel exposure. I want to thank Wilson Sansini for the reception tonight. And I think a couple of the lawyers are here. If you are, wave your hands. Um, so thank you so much. We are going to have a nice party after all the pitches. And uh, be sure you tweet about us. Okay, we, we, we are, in fact, in the year 2018, and we tweet. Um, and I want to introduce the judges. So. We um, carefully constructed the judging panel to represent different parts of the life science um, investor ecosystem. So we have represented uh, a sovereign wealth fund, a, a couple of traditional VCs, a corporate VC, uh, some life science angels, and what have I missed, uh, an accelerator. So 
I thought it was important that we get different perspectives. So let me, let me just quickly introduce everyone. I'm gonna, this is alphabetical. So Vanita Agarwaler um, is a venture partner at Google Ventures. Vanita is passionate about the intersection of data science and healthcare. She was director of product management at Flatiron Health, uh, which is now being acquired by Roche very recently. Before that, she was at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. She's been a computational researcher at Cold Spring Harbor, Lawrence Livermore, and a management consultant for biotech pharma and device clients at McKinsey. She holds an MD, PhD from Harvard MIT. So welcome, Vanita. Um, oh, yes, we should. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Next is Arvind Gupta, Managing Director and Founder of IndieBio. Uh, IndieBio is a four-month program that turns scientists into entrepreneurs. I'm quoting from his website. Uh, he builds groundbreaking biotech companies and, in fact, is having your pitch night very soon, as I recall. Arvind has a different kind of background. He was an options market maker. He has been design director at IDEO and he co-founded a company that had a personal fitness app with thousands of users in 98 countries. Then he joined a venture fund, SOSV, and founded IndieBio. So thank you, Arvind, he represents an accelerator. <laughs> Carl Handelsman is investment director at Roche Venture Fund and also a private angel investor. Carl focuses on early stage therapeutics and synthetic biology ventures. He has mentored and taught for the Entrepreneurship Center for years as a long-term friend from back in the Boston days. He formerly was with CMEA Capital, an MIT Sloan MBA, and an MS Genetics from Harvard Med. Uh, Carl is always there when I call on him. Thank you for coming, Carl. Richard Julis is chair of the Life Science Special Interest Group, Band of Angels. So Band of Angels is a group of 150 plus angel investors who do seed stage investments. He personally is an active angel investor, has extensive financial general management consulting and board experience with pharma and tech companies. His MBA is from Columbia. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Carolyn Ng is principal of Vertex Ventures, which is the venture capital firm for Tomasic, the sovereign wealth fund for the government of Singapore. Uh, the fund invests across all sectors of healthcare and at all stages of development, from early stage companies testing transformative technologies to um, later stage, commercial stage. She has a PhD in cancer molecular biology from the National University of Singapore. Thank you, Carolyn, for joining us. <laughs> and uh, Diego Ray, visiting partner from Y Combinator. So Y Combinator is uh, recently had a big push into biotech, and Diego has come in to help them with that. Uh, he's been helping bio and healthcare companies launch. He is founder and CEO of GeneWeave Biosciences, which was acquired by Roche Molecular Diagnostics, and he has a PhD in bioengineering from Cornell University. And last is Jamie Topper. He's managing general partner at Fraser Healthcare. He is the head of the life sciences team and has spent 13 years at Fraser. He's invested across 20 companies and focused on therapeutics and early stage. They just raised their 11th fund for $780 million. Before that, he was head of the cardiovascular R&D part of Millennium Pharmaceuticals, and he has an MD, PhD from Stanford. So I don't know about you, but I'm very impressed with our judges. Should we give them all a hand? Okay, I think we're just about ready for what we're all here for, the pitches. Okay, they don't look that mean, do they? Uh, but they're ready to roll. So, uh, number one pitch. We're gonna have eight minute pitches, two minutes for judge feedback. No questions from the audience, sorry, no time. Hi everyone, 
I'm Dr. Christy Sheehy, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Sea Light Technologies. And we're looking to revolutionize the prognosis and monitoring of multiple sclerosis. So this is Lucy. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 24. One morning, she woke up, and the left side of her body felt a little bit tingly. Has anyone here ever woken up with a, your hand asleep or your foot asleep? Usually that's something that we would just shrug off. Lucy did the same thing. Later on in the day, she, she went for a run. She was training for a half marathon. And she noticed while she was running, the left side of her body felt very heavy and very weak. And by the time she got home, she had to physically lift her left leg up the stairs to call 911 for help. 24 months later, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And she joined the 950,000 people in the US that have MS. About 85% of patients will have what's called relapsing remitting MS, meaning they have periods of disease stability followed by periods of rapid decline called relapses. And in Lucy's case, the disability she got from her relapse remained permanent. Each relapse can cost upward of $10,000. And unfortunately, with increasing disabilities also come increasing costs. In fact, MS has a healthcare burden of $7.5 billion in the US. And a lot of that is due to the unpredictable nature of the disease and a complete lack of prognosis tools, as well as monitoring tools for the disease itself. Right now, we use expert physicians that dedicate 20 to 40 minutes of their exam time doing what's called a neurostatus exam. So they're testing motor function and cognitive function in all of these patients. Additionally, we do lumbar punctures with patients, which is literally a needle to your spine. And then finally, patients will go through MRIs. And these can be extremely time consuming and unfortunately, also very expensive. And we saw an opportunity to bridge this gap in tools. And that's why we invented C-Light. We're a patented, non-invasive retinal eye tracking technology. We have three working prototypes, one here right at UCSF, one at UC Berkeley, and one at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. It just takes minutes to run. And actually, it works by imaging the very back of the eye, which is also the very front of the brain. And you can see that in an image here on the left. We record motion a thousand times per second, and then this motion is then extracted out, as you can see with the red and the blue graph on the right. And this is an actual MS patient that came into clinic complaining that the world felt like it was moving and they couldn't find anything wrong with her until they put her in our machine. So based on this eye motion data, we then write a report and tell, and tell physicians exactly what motor function definites, deficits that patients have. And we do this on the micron scale. So imagine a single strand of human hair. One one hundredth the size of that is the motor function that we're assessing here. And right now is an amazing time, actually, for MS diagnostics because the therapeutics are really catching up. So disease-modifying therapies are now able to mitigate relapses, both the duration as well as the severity. There's two caveats with that, though. The first, you have to pick the right one. And the second, you have to do it as early on in the disease as possible in order to really limit disability of a patient. Now, C-Light can really help this process because right now, patients are waiting six months trying a drug, seeing if it works, and if it doesn't, they have to keep switching. And in the meantime, relapses are still happening and the cost of their healthcare is continually rising. By implementing our technology, we could offer a prognostic or a disease course that doctors could then utilize in choosing the right drugs. This provides value to not only patients and physicians by having an objective tool and even offering revenue via reimbursement codes, but it also provides values to payers through less hospitalization and also therapeutic developers who are looking for objective endpoints for their new drug. We're looking to first target MS specialists. And these are gonna be the early adopters within the field. And once we've gained traction here, we can then move on to general neurology. 
And of this, there is a $2 billion market cap. Our end goal is to be in every primary care clinic. If you imagine how blood pressure is for the cardiovascular system, so could sea light be for neurological health. And eye motion abnormalities aren't just with MS. Concussion, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, they're all there. The neurodiagnostics market is climbing by 9% annually. And we're excited to be a part of it. In terms of competition, everything to the left of the blue line that you see up there is the gold standard. We have blood tests, VEPs, um, other pupil trackers out there. We're 150 times more accurate than the current pupil tracking technology. And as you'll notice, there's no prognostic device on the market. In terms of IP, we have a patent from UC Berkeley. We have a letter of intent on file for an exclusive license there. Additionally, we have a portable and handheld version of our device that we, de that we developed in-house. And finally, we have a methods patent that we just recently are finishing up in order to, um, in order to close out our STTR grant with UCSF. Our regulatory path, so there are other scanning laser ophthalmoscopes on the market. This would require a 510K for our device. However, the indication of neurological health is different. All SLOs have been used for retinal disease. And so there's potential here that we could go with a de novo filing. In terms of our milestones, we're looking towards FDA regulatory approval. And so all of our future funding from the orange line on is where we are today. I have the privilege of working with an amazing group of people here, standing right behind me. Uh, we have experience from Deloitte, Regeneron, Corning, and we're very passionate about this mission. Additionally, our company itself is advised by an amazing group of people that we're humbled to work with daily, ranging from ophthalmic device entrepreneurs to the top of academia and the clinical field. And of course, we also have our Startup 101 mentors who are here in the house. Their advice has been absolutely invaluable to our progress. Sea light, the patented non-invasive the patented non-invasive eye tracking tool that we aim to use as a prognostic device to help patients stand up to MS. Thank you. I have a question. Is this the one? Yeah. Question, so what, what is the data that this is actually has prognostic significance? I didn't see that. So we don't have any of the data slides up here. I'm happy to show you a bunch of the data after the class. Um, basically, earlier on in the disease, eye motion abnormalities are minute and they grow with disability. And so depending on what track of MS you have, your brain stem might be more involved for for um, progressive disease. And with brainstem involvement, which is for MS the big thing, that's what makes you disabled and unable to walk, it affects your emotion. And so for patients that have progressive disease, you can see deficits in their fixational eye motion much sooner than you could ever see for a relapsing or admitting patient. And usually right now, all they're doing to, to assess progressive disease is checking um, your gait, so you're walking. So imagine waiting for your brainstem to have so many lesions that your legs physically aren't moving. We're measuring that motor deficit at a micron. And so I'd be happy to share more about the data with you after. Maybe just a simpler way to ask that question. Of all presenting patients at the time that they first have symptoms, what fraction of them do you think you would be able to detect? So right now, 76% of the patients have an eye motion deficit that we've tested. We've tested 110 MS patients. So 76% of them show some sort of eye motion or fixation abnormality in our 110 cohort. So even with the early detection, what are the points where you feel like the therapeutic intervention could be useful? So particularly for, um, I mean, once you're diagnosed with MS, the longer you wait, you're losing neurons. There's no drug out there that can remyelinate your brain. So therapeutic intervention needs to happen quick and aggressively. And so physicians now, um, actually at UCSF, Acrevis or Acrevis was recently um, FDA approved, and this can help completely mitigate relapses. Um, the issue that a lot of therapeutics have had now is, is that many of them are only 30% effective. And so I'm hoping with Acrevis this can definitely change, but ultimately therapeutic intervention needs to happen as soon as possible to mitigate any loss of neurons.
Hi, my name is Nadav Aituv, and I'm a professor here in UCSF, and I'm extremely excited to let you know about our company called Enhancer Therapeutics, which is a gene therapy company for big genes. And so, as you have probably know, there's a lot of hype now for gene therapy, in particular with the recent FDA approval for Spark Therapeutics to treat blindness. Uh, there's a lot of investment in this field, and there's a lot of talk of potentially curing genes and diseases that were once thought to be uncurable. However, gene therapy has a major limitation, and that is that the main virus currently used for gene therapy, which is a deno-associated virus, can only fit small genes into it. And as such, if you have a disease that's caused by a big gene, it will not fit into this virus and cannot be treated with gene therapy. And that's a big problem. For example, if we look at genes that lead to diseases due to low dosage, which are the genes that we're in particular interested in, you can see that actually the majority of them are big genes, genes that will not fit into adeno-associated virus and as such cannot be treated with gene therapy. So we in the, as a company are developing game-changing technology that can target these big genes that before could not be treated by gene therapy, but now with our technology could be targeted through gene therapy. And I'll show you an example of one gene that we're being focusing on called PKD1. So mutations in PKD1 it lead to a disease called autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. It affects one in 2,500 people in the U.S. And what it does is, unlike us, we have a normal kidney the size of my fist. These patients have cysts that keep on growing in the kidney that lead to a kidney the size of a football, as you can see here. This leads to a lot of complications that sadly end with end-stage renal disease and death at around the age of 53 for these patients. Here I'm showing you a patient called Wayne Smith who has this disease. As this is a genetic disease, both his daughters have the disease, his father had the disease and died at the age of nine, and Wayne is being treated here with dialysis for this disease. Sadly, Wayne is being treated exactly the same way that his father was treated 50 years ago. Nothing really changed in terms of the treatment for these patients. These patients are first put on drugs to treat their symptoms. With time, kidney function gets worse, and then they go to dialysis, which can provide them six to seven years of life. And if they're lucky, they can get on the kidney transplant wait list, and after five to 10 years, may get a kidney transplant that can increase their lifespan. ADPKD is a genetic disease, and as such, gene therapy could be a great treatment for ADPKD. In order to understand how we can treat it with ADPKD, uh, with gene therapy, we'll go through a bit of genetics 101. So we usually have two copies of PKD1, and two copies lead to normal levels of PKD1. However, these patients have one copy that is non-functional, and due to that, they have half the amount of PKD1. And technically, this could be fine, and there's a lot of genes that are perfectly fine with actually having one copy. But sadly, for PKD1, this is not enough, and this is similar to running on empty, where you don't have any of the protein in this case. So technically, we could fix this by gene therapy. We can bring in a virus with PKD1 that will increase the levels and basically fix the disease. But as I mentioned to you in the beginning, PKD1 is a gigantic gene. It's actually 13,000 KB long, sorry, 13,000 base pairs, and that's really one of the biggest genes that we have in the genome and too big to fit into this virus. So we at Enhancer Therapeutics came up with a novel approach that can use a specific molecule that specifically binds to the existing normal copy of this gene, increases the levels that it makes, and brings them close to, wild, to normal, as you can see here. PKD is a big market. Uh, patients with ADPKD, there's 25,000 in the US that undergo dialysis now. This is $100,000 a year cost. And there's 1,200 people with this disease that go, uh, undergo transplants. And that's uh, estimated to be $200,000 in the first year. Initially, uh, we want to focus on the severe cases, which we estimate to be 600 million a year, and later on grow globally to a total global market that we estimate to be at $15 billion. 
Our competitors are mainly focusing on drugs to treat the symptoms. And so these are some of our competitors, and there is quite a movement in this field recently. Otsuka Pharmaceuticals is probably the most in advanced, and they have a drug called Tolpavan that should come out in September to be approved in the US for treatment. But that only reduces the number of cysts and increases the lifespan of the patient by two years. Our approach is completely different, where we target the cause of this disease and not treat the symptoms for it. We've assembled a great team. This was invented here at UCSF in my lab, along with a postdoc in my lab, Navneet. And we've joined up with two great scientists, Asaf from Tel Aviv University and Hwan from here in Gladstone Institutes. And our business development is Matt Divak, who has previous experience in gene therapy. We've also been teaming up with Mayon Park, who heads the UCSF PKD Center of Excellence here. And in addition, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our mentors, Bob Dunkel, who's here in the audience, and Yael Weiss, who's an unofficial mentor, who's also here in the audience. We've already got funding from the UCSF Catalyst Award. We finished our in vitro studies. Our mouse studies are underway. We've submitted an SBIR, and we filed a non-provisional patent through UCSF in February of this year. We're currently at this stage right here. We hope to finish talk studies by the end of the year and IND enabling near next, the end of next year. We hope to raise $1.5 million for this, and this is an orphan disease, which allows us uh, to do a lot more in that sense. I want to point out that we're a platform technology, and as such, we're focusing on other big genes also that lead to devastating diseases. So in summary, ADPKD is our initial target. We have 18 months for proof of concept, and we're a platform technology company that focuses on big genes, trying to allow gene therapy to be delivered for these genes also. Thank you very much, and we're very happy to talk to you afterwards. So what is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to show you afterwards in terms of this. No, but is it a it's small molecule? So it uses activator. AAV for delivery, basically, but it allows for a sh much smaller de uh, payload in that AAV to deliver it specifically to that region and increase transcription of that gene, basically. How do you intend to deliver it? What's the route of administration? So for uh, ADBKD, basically renal vein delivery with AAV9 is usually what is being shown to be good in mouse models, and we're about to try that here. Um, and it could be delivered technically to the kidney with any DNA delivery system. So two questions. Uh, one, how do you get past the immunogenicity of the virus? And then mm -hmm. second, uh, how many big genes are there? So if you look at uh, big genes in general, um, there's about 9% of them in general, of all the genes, not necessarily the ones that lead to disease. That's for your first question. A uh, second question, sorry. For your first question, in terms of immunodeficiency, as I mentioned, for a kidney, it doesn't have to be through an AAV. We can also deliver it in other ways, and same for other diseases that are not kidney or neuro in a sense. And so if I understood correctly on the, what, it's, what it's actually doing, you're basically upregulating the gene that's still there to compensate for the loss of the other one. Uh, so is, uh, is, there, is it as simple as that in, in terms of the, the biology of the system, or are there any other consequences so, of, of No, that? so it's simple with that. We have uh, very nice preliminary results, not only for this disease, but for another disease that leads to obesity, where we actually completely rescue the phenotype in the mice using this. That's great. We need to stop here. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. My name is Will Haskins. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Griffin Bio. We're a therapeutics company focused on precision medicines that accelerate brain repair in children with severe traumatic brain injury. This is a $1 billion orphan disease market. And I'm going to begin my talk today by describing how waves in the ocean are actually very similar to the waves in the brain of children with, uh, with TBI. So each uh, wave in the ocean is unique. And if you're a surfer considering that, uh, you might wonder, how am I going to tackle this big wave? Years of experience will help, uh, good timing, precision, and a lot of courage. This is exactly the approach that we're going to take with Griffin to tackle traumatic brain injury. So TBI is actually the major cause of death and disability in children, period, globally. 
Um, you can imagine if you have a child that's injured during a soccer game or falls out of a tree in a car accident or, heaven forbid, in a war as this child was in, uh, you would rush to the hospital and hope for some help, like Dan described earlier. Uh, you want to ease the suffering of your child. Unfortunately, there's no therapeutics for TBI. In fact, the standard of care is basically to keep your kids safe and warm and hope for the best. Why are there no therapeutics? There's actually been 30 phase three clinical trials, all failed. The reason why is that just like those waves, each patient is unique, each injury is unique, and there was no biomarkers, like Dan described, to guide preclinical development of therapy, stratify patients, or to provide surrogate endpoints. So we founded Griffin Bio to address this problem specifically. Uh, from 2004 to 2018, my co-founder and I actually published hundreds of papers on biomarkers of traumatic brain injury and multiple sclerosis. And in the first paper, we discovered more than 100 protein biomarkers that we could measure in the blood of TBI patients uh, because there was damage to the blood-brain barrier, and those brain proteins passed into the blood and can be used as unique signatures for these patients. We did similar types of studies uh, in more recent years for models of multiple sclerosis and showed that just like those waves in the ocean, we could see waves in the blood of these patients and use those as a readout for biomarker development as well as drug development. So this cartoon on the left illustrates the profiles for a couple of different subjects or different patients, one in green and one in red, where the y-axis shows the levels of biomarkers in the blood and the x-axis is the post-injury time. And you can see, following traumatic brain injury, there's a very different profile for the patient that has the green trace versus the red trace, but maybe had a more severe injury and then a secondary event. Uh, in this case, I'm showing both patients start to have some naturally occurring brain repair. This could be weeks, months, or years later after the event. However, one out of six children with severe TBI actually die. What are we measuring in the blood? We're actually measuring the subcellular and cellular uh, fragments that are generated after traumatic brain injury. So for example, a neuron is cleaved, and these proteins and debris from the neuron actually pass across the damaged blood brain barrier, and we can measure those in the blood. So uh, many things aligned during this class. It's been a terrific opportunity. And we actually made the news at CNN in February of this year. Two of the 100 biomarkers that my co-founder and I uh, discovered 14 years ago actually became the first two biomarkers as the first blood test for concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. So for me personally, this is the biggest thing that happened in my whole scientific career. It's uh, great news. And for the patients, this is a great uh, opportunity to develop drugs. So our purpose of Griffin Bio is, can be summarized with the mission and vision statement. We're, we intend to receive the first FDA approval for the first precision medicine that accelerates brain repair in children. And our vision is actually to pioneer these types of brain biomarker wave-driven precision medicines uh, by working with partnering companies. So we kind of have a two-pronged approach to this. We have a proprietary platform to both trace and decode biomarker waves in the blood as I'm showing here. And we actually also have lead compounds for precision medicines that accelerate brain repair. And the idea is that we'll use those lead compounds to both dampen the wave or the amplitude as well as shorten its length. And we actually have preclinical data in multiple preclinical models, or animal models, showing that we can do exactly this. So this is super exciting for us because not only do we have a lead compound, but we also have a readout to further develop these uh, drugs. So as a scientist, for me it's a really important uh, step in any experiment when you have some positive data or something to build upon. So we have that positive data to build upon. Our initial uh, target market is children with diffuse axonal injury. This is a subtype of severe TBI which we think will be good uh, for the lead compound we have. There's about 33,000 children in the U.S. each year. Uh, they get this. This is a segue to the larger market for TBI, 2 million new adult TBI patients in the U.S. alone, uh, which is about a $30 billion market. And as I said, we're going to be working with sponsors for other demyelinating indications like multiple sclerosis, where many of the biomarkers are similar. Our outlicensing business model can be summarized here. We'll try to outlicense our uh, brain biomarker ways for preclinical studies of sponsors for their lead compounds. We already have some interest in this from major pharma. 
antibody reagents to measure those biomarkers, clinical validation of the reagents to add value, and of course, our own precision medicines that accelerate brain repair, we plan to outlicense after a successful phase one or two trial. Our IP portfolio is super strong. We have 100 uh, biomarkers covered in four patents. We're submitting two more patents this year for the lead compounds. This is really a lock on the space. Our milestones are shown here. In addition to patenting our lead compounds, uh, we will begin in our second biomarker to manufacture the reagents, uh, get clinical validation of those uh, antibody reagents, and then start our IND-enabling preclinical testing with our lead compounds that accelerate brain repair and with our own antibody reagents as a readout for these waves. I've been really privileged to work with this incredible team uh, shown here. Uh, they're all brilliant. Uh, as you can see, they're from top-tier institutions. We try to have a little bit of fun. This is an awesome responsibility, and then uh, it's important to keep a good sense of humor. So we have Lorenzo, who's a hexalingual data guru for us. We have a healthcare warrior, Eric, who's an expert in business strategy. Uh, Barbara Cellona, who's an Italian movie star, believe it or not. Uh, we have a nuclear reprogrammer, and then for myself, I'm a bit of a molecular nomad. Uh, I've worked at Redwood Bioscience as the director of R&D there and at Genentech. And we also have a, an awesome SAB with experience in pediatric clinical trials, neuroimmunology, biostatistics, and then my co-founder is ar arguably the most famous person in the TBI space, uh, Kevin Wang. I'll just say we have a clear regulatory path. Uh, this is an excerpt from a letter to UCSF where Dr. Manley is the PI for the Track TBI Consortium, essentially saying, please do this. Develop precision medicines with, our biomark with biomarkers. And then in summary, Griffin Bio is focused on severe TBI children, which is an orphan indication. We have a proprietary platform to look at those waves as a readout for drug development of our lead compounds and an outlicensing business model. So thank you so much for your time. Please reach out. My email is will at griffinbio.com. So uh, uh, how, uh, how bad does the brain injury need to be in order for you guys to detect these biomarkers? Is, are, are they, do, do they naturally occur without injury? Um, so it's a great question. So the two markers that were just approved by the FDA, uh, UCHL1 and GFAP, we can measure several weeks out in a mild TBI patient. So we're going after the severe TBI patient where it's very easy to measure. So this is an interesting space, mild TBI, but maybe not the space for drug development initially. And you're, with your lead compounds, um, you're, you're going to delay developing those until the biomarker program is complete or so, well along? No, actually, because the two uh, biomarkers were already approved by the FDA, we're going to leverage those two markers to develop our lead compounds while we're in parallel developing new markers. And, and where did the compounds come from, from your lab itself? Or? Uh, we can talk after if you're interested. Yeah. <laughs> Midnight rate. Yeah. I mean, this is a really important question because with 30 failed phase three clinical trials, um, you know, why aren't there more lead compounds, right? Do you call your medicines precision medicines because they'll only work in certain patients with certain biomarkers or because they target specific pathways? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, as a drug developer myself in the antibody drug conjugate space, I didn't initially know the difference between personalized and precision medicine. So precision medicine is we're using biomarkers to guide treatment uh, for one class of drugs. We're not getting a different class of drugs to different uh, folks. And you can think about it as a, we'll select responders and stratify patients and have surrogate endpoints for our clinical trials with those biomarkers. Yeah. Hey everybody, good evening. I'm Rachel Fischel and I am the founder and CEO of Quick Stitch Surgical. I am so excited to present to you our methodology for developing the world's first automated wound closure device for open incision. Do me a favor, imagine that your wife, sister, close friend is about to deliver her first baby. You head into the emergency room with her and she's immediately whisked off to the operating room for an emergency C-section, leaving you alone and scared. When she's in the operating room, you find out that she starts bleeding excessively from her uterus. As this is happening, the only tools at the surgeon's disposal are a needle, thread, and the surgeon's own two hands. 
Unfortunately, this problem is not as uncommon as you might think. Every day in the United States, 260 women lose massive amounts of blood during C-sections. The average C-section takes about 45 minutes from start to finish. 35 of those minutes are spent suturing. That's 35 minutes that that brand new mom could be holding her baby, but instead she's being sewn up. Not only is it time consuming, it's also, in a, it's, it's also inconsistent. So every stitch that's delivered is done by hand, leaving room for error. So why does it take so long? First of all, it's done by hand, as I mentioned. Second of all, it, we have incredibly long incisions that can be more than 30 centimeters long. When you're closing these incisions, you have to start from the bottom and work your way up layer by layer, and this takes a while. Because of the way that wound closure is currently done, it requires three instruments and therefore two clinicians. Finally, it requires a high level of precision. If you tie a knot too tightly, you'll cut off blood supply. And if you tie a knot too loosely, you can leave dead space in the incision, leaving room for other complications. So how is Quick Stitch going to improve this? First, we're going to automate parts of this process. Unlike some of our competitors that are used for laparoscopic procedures, our device can be used in these long incisions that we're talking about. Just like current sutures, it works in any layer of tissue, only requires one clinician to use because it's automated, and finally, because it's automated, increases the level of precision of every stitch. We believe that by automating parts of the wound closure process, we'll be able to reduce complications and actually decrease wound closure time. By doing so, we think we can also cut costs. So this is an outline, pretty overwhelming, of all of the steps as written by a plastic surgeon involved in tying one interrupted stitch. This is how we plan to fix it. <laughs> we want to simplify the process significantly, leaving less room for error. So what is our solution? Our device is going to automate three simple steps. First, the device will deliver the needle through the tissue that has already been brought together by the surgeon. Next, it'll tie a square knot. And finally, it'll cut the tail end of the suture. And this right here is the part that eliminates the need for the second clinician. We can also deliver continuous sutures by decoupling the first step of this process from the other two. Obviously, wound closure happens in just about every surgical procedure you can imagine, so it's a pretty big market. Quick Stitch is focusing specifically on open procedures, which are non-minimally invasive, so not through a tiny hole. Every year, the world spends $50 billion on wound closure products for these open procedures. In the United States alone, we spend $1.3 billion for obstetric and gynecological open procedure wound closure. Quick Stitch is focusing specifically on the C-section market as its first, which is valued at a billion dollars. So why C-sections? First, if we can do it faster, we can reduce blood loss. Next, because 75% of wound or, excuse me, 75 of a C-section is spent doing wound closure, we can actually do more procedures in a day if we can reduce that time significantly. Next, there's an obvious need. OBGYNs are currently using surgical staplers in some cases. The only reason they use it is because it decreases the time. It actually has poorer outcomes, though. And finally, it's obviously a big market. We have one in three babies in the United States is born via C-section, and that number is increasing. Eventually, we plan to expand into other markets, such as plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, and general surgery. As we plan to tackle such a large market, we anticipate partnership with at least one of the two major players in wound closure. According to the Vice President of Medical Device Innovation at Johnson & Johnson, Ethicon currently has about 90% market share in wound closure. Fortunately for us, both of these companies prefer to acquire new technologies rather than innovate in-house in most cases. Therefore, we're developing our solution to be able to use off-the-shelf sutures developed by either of these companies so that it's an attractive acquisition target for either one of them. So, despite the fact that there's nothing on the market quite like Quick Stitch, other people have tried to decrease the time with which it takes, uh, with which it takes to close an incision. Some of the tools that they've implemented are barbed suture, surgical staplers, and bioabsorbable staplers. But none of these things compare to Quick Stitch in terms of their ability to improve the efficiency and consistency of wound closure in any layer of tissue without compromising outcomes. So as you can see here, over the next 18 months, we're going to be fairly busy. 
we anticipate that we'll need approximately $800,000 to get our prototype up and working with the assistance of several surgeons who are working with us currently in order to develop a regulatory strategy and get to this point where we can do proof of concept testing in cadaveric tissue. We just recently filed our first provisional patent and plan to expand this patent for portfolio in the near future. And we anticipate that we will be a class two uh, moderate risk device following a 510K approval pathway. One strategy that we're currently considering is the development of a device specifically for veterinary medicine to allow for a source of revenue prior to FDA approval. Once we obtain FDA approval, we plan to seek partnership with physicians who are champions for our device. Once a physician decides that he or she would like to purchase our device, we'll work with hospitals for distribution. Lucky for us, wound closure products are currently included in bundled payments for surgeries. What this means is that for us, for Quick Stitch, as long as we do not increase the cost of procedure, or we're able to either maintain it or decrease it, which we truly believe we'll be able to do, then our device is automatically reimbursed. In order to bring our device to market, we have assembled an excellent team who I have the pleasure of standing here next to today. I'm Rachel Fischel, and I'm currently leading the team as a master's student at UCSF. And I have a background in clinical project management and medical device sales with Johnson & Johnson. To my left is Piani Gandhi, who's currently leading our engineering efforts, who's also in the Master's of Translational Medicine program, and Ivory Dean, who's leading our market research efforts. Unfortunately, Dr. Eli Kamara is unable to be here tonight as he has clinical duties, but he has been assisting greatly with all of his clinical insight. We've also assembled an excellent team outside of UCSF, including clinicians, engineers, and experienced professionals. And I would love to give a shout out to Ellen Springer, who's in the audience tonight. She's our wonderful mentor through UCSF. Together, we are Quick Stitch Surgical. We're working to bring you the world's first automated wound closure device for open incisions. Thank you. What is the intended footprint of this equipment? How does it look like? <laughs> Great question. So there's kind of a reason why we're not expressly putting this out there yet. We're at a very early stage and we have a leading concept and we're in the process of building our first iteration. However, that first iteration is not going to look anything like what the future iterations will look like. So we have a leading concept and I'm happy to talk to you more about it um, afterwards. You had a, you know, a lot of talk about the speed of stitching up uh, closures. I assume this is also going to do exterior, uh, the, the final exterior skin uh, closure. How much uh, thought have you given to the aesthetic outcome of that closure? That's a great question. So our current chief medical officer is a plastic surgeon, and his like his big care is how, how good it looks, and he spends his career suturing. So we've put a lot of thought into it, and we think that there's a lot of elements of consistency and the level of tension. So if you tie a knot too loosely on the, on the skin, it leaves dead space between the, the left and right side of the incision, and that leads to poorer outcomes. And if you tie it too loosely, you get bunching of the skin that also gets you like a lumpy scar. So we think that by improving the consistency, we can actually improve the cosmetic outcomes as well. So how does this compare to companies like uh, Zipline Medical? They, they, got, they get rid of the, the needle. Great question. So Zipline can only be used in the outermost layer of tissue, the skin. So most of our competitors are either for laparoscopic tissue or, um, like you mentioned, like Zipline, um, can only be used externally. Things like skin glue and other things like that are similar. So situations where you can't get rid of a needle. So say that again, I'm sorry? Situations where you can't get rid of a needle. Right, so yeah, you, you just can't use things like the zipline medical, you can't leave that inside the body. Yeah. That's the idea. So we are not trying to leave anything inside the body. We're doing it exactly as we do now, using the same sutures and materials as surgeons would currently use. Good. My name is Ewing Win, and I'm a postdoc in Jim Wells' lab here at UCSF. And together with my team, Atabak Bioscience, we are an early stage venture um, based here at UCSF, and we are developing a targeting platform to improve gene therapy. So for decades, gene therapy has promised to cure inherited diseases. While we know a lot about the genetic basis that cause 
each of these genetic disorders from sickle cell anemia to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We still have not been able to cure them due to the challenge of delivering, delivering effectively the corrective genes to the disease cells in the body. This is because current AV gene therapy broadly delivers its genes throughout the body instead of to the desired tissues um, depicted here in red on the left. And because of this, it, in order to deliver enough the therapeutic genes to the right cells that need the genes, uh, high viral doses are needed, which can then cause high level toxicity and immune response. So after my solution is to use antibody guided AVs, our guided virus can be specifically targeted to right cells, effectively delivering the therapeutic genes while minimizing the viral dose. This enables us to reduce the to toxicity and immune response potentially caused by the gene delivery. So for example, current AAV designed to target the muscle cells will also d deliver its gene to other tissues in the body. In contrast, our antibody virus will be precisely guided to the muscle cells, effectively delivering the genes needed in the minimal dose. Furthermore, our unique platform offers a plug and play approach to retarget the existing virus to any cell type by simply exchanging the engineer antibodies on the virus surface. So at this stage, we are building our platform that based on the two core technologies. The first is the rapid development of the targeting antibodies, and the second is the proprietary chemistry that we use to link the antibodies on the uh, AAVs. Our intellectual property strategy includes the proprietary chemistry that we have in our lab and we're also going to generate additional IPs on the targeting antibodies and the entire gene therapy products. Atabai aims to grow into a successful early stage venture by following two parallel strategies. Our primary focus will be on developing our gene therapy products and our initial indication will be Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We will also identify strategic partnership with other established companies to develop best-in-class therapies. As for our first indication, Duchenne muscular dystrophies, DMD, it affects one in 3,500 newborn boys, and it's, it is an orphan indication. And as the disease progresses, the patient will lose mobility and require ventilation without which many would die by the early 20s. The current standard of care is thorough treatment just to avoid the unavoidable um, complete loss of muscle strength, um, which takes away patient's life. Tragically, at this point, there's no cure for DMD. We pursue DMD because of the challenge to deliver effectively the therapeutic genes to widely distribute muscle cells in a more safe manner. We see a strong market opportunity in DMD for our targeted therapy. Uh, our core market will, be, will consist up to 35% of the on DMD patients who are young uh, patients suitable for AV gene therapy. This represents up to $1.5 billion worth of market size, and we will can continue to deliver this treatment for newly diagnosed patients. Existing therapeutics in DMD space have not, no by no means conquered the market. A single approved therapy is not curative, it's, not, it's only suitable for a small segment of patients and has very limited efficacy. Other gene therapies products are still in early clinical trials and with recent report of clinical toxicity due to high viral dose, clearly there's a need for better and safer delivery. And Atabai Bioscience are confident that our technology will provide a solution for this indication. We have set two milestones for developing our core gene therapy products. We have demonstrated um, 
our proprietary chemistry are now in process of designing the targeting molecules, the synthesis of the AVs, and this, the candidate screening in cell model. After this, we are going to develop the proof of concept in mouse model for DMD. We expect uh, to clear the first milestone within 12 months and anticipate um, $700,000 funding to do so. We have a strong board of advisors, including UCSF professor and veteran biotech entrepreneur, Dr. Jim Wells, as well as Dr. Jordan Strober, a DMD expert here at UCSF Children's Hospital, who also conducts clinical trials in mus muscular dystrophies. We also have received invaluable advice from our mentors, Samuel Wu and David Spellmeyer. Our team at Adobe Bioscience have extensive experience in protein engineering, genome engineering, biochemical chemistry, and drug discovery from UC, UCSF and UC Berkeley. We are committed to developing our core technology into a gene therapy venture with the aim to develop cure for young patients with genetic disorder for life. So in closing, we are at the Biosciences and we are developing targeted gene therapy platform. Our initial indication in DMD with a $1.5 billion market opportunity and desperate need of a cure. Looking forward, our unique modular platform will position us to make an impact in a growing gene therapy market. My name is Yuen Win, and on behalf of my team, we thank you and look forward to our next conversation. Thank you. Uh, so, trophism or targeting of AAV and vivo is kind of a black box here. Um, it's usually just inter determined empirically, and certainly for every existing vector. So, have you demonstrated in vivo that you can get rational antibody mediated targeting of a viable virus? We uh, have dem demonstrated the, the with the chemistry so, so far, but it has been demonstrated with other targeting molecules and not with antibody that you can actually retarget to the distinct cell type to the science. But they are limited in terms of the rapid generations to other t different cell types. I, I know it's early, but do you have any feel for what the cost might be? I know the Sarepta product, both the selling price and the cost, is very, very high. So it varies from um, the age of the patient. It's just sort of patient size. I think they typically uh, charge at least thirty hundred, so three hundred thousand dollars for the young patients to begin, and that will increase over the years. Um, that's it. It's a price annually. So that's that's how they charge these patients. Why do you believe you'll be able to this particular uh, uh, antibody conjugated virus will be able to not be immunogenic? Um, over time. I think there's also, we, based on our um, information interviews with lots of like, the, uh, AV experts in the field, um, and they find that by lowering the dose, you can sort of get away from many of the potential toxicity issues. Um, and that's where we think we're going to add additional values to, to by doing so. That's still a primary challenge in the, in the AV gene therapy. But with the technology of the conjugation, we still can think that we can also address it in the future if we have the opportunity to do so. Good evening. I'm Vanda Sega Wallace, the co founder and CEO of WeFit, where we are building heart health socially. Imagine you could reverse the need for a medication. I would appreciate that, not currently, but for my family. Meet my parents. Both my mother and father have high cholesterol, and my mom was first diagnosed with high blood pressure when she was just about my age. But they're certainly not alone. 75 million American adults have high blood pressure, and over 100 million have high cholesterol. And what's more, at age 50, 90% have a lifetime risk of high blood pressure, and 62% actually have high cholesterol. <clears throat> Evidence has also shown that high cholesterol medication is the second most prescribed drug in the United States. And losing just 10 pounds when overweight will help to reduce your blood pressure level. 
I also found a study that showed among individuals that were age 50 and over that introduced at least 90 minutes of physical exercise into their weekly routine reduced their health care costs by over $2,000 per year and reduced their cardiac cardiovascular events. So what's the problem? Well, pharmaceutical medication is the standard of care. There are often no alternatives, but many adverse side effects. And in speaking with our cardiologist advisor, we learned that patients lack ongoing health management support for high blood pressure and high cholesterol, which naturally translates into poor outcomes. When we asked what would be the largest fitness motivator among our interviewees, the leading response was a fun social community and support group. And when I was specifically speaking to this baby boomer exercise extraordinaire, as I call her, she further professed, our cohort is often overlooked. We have the funds and we have the interest. So why social health? What are the benefits of social health? Well, studies have shown mental health support and depression prevention as well as isolation avoidance, which is increasingly more important as we age. And how can you deny accountability and motivation? When I was at the airport, I was reading Fast Company magazine, and I came across this quote from Tina Sharkey, who is the co-founder and CEO of Brandless. And she comments, people are craving human interaction. It's going to move the needle more than any technology you could ever dream up. It's with that in mind, we have created the WeFit Digital Therapeutic Solution, where we are shifting from a pharmaceutical approach to a social <coughs> fitness alternative. We are creating a mobile application that will socially assemble fitness enthusiasts, particularly age 50 and over, real time. We are utilizing cardiac risk assessments to then create a personalized heart health roadmap that will help in reducing high cholesterol and hypertension, all with the ultimate goal of decreased healthcare spending, improved heart health outcomes, and enhanced overall wellness. Let's take a closer look at the user interface. You'll see up top is my profile, along with the number of heart coins achieved thus far. In the center, you will see that Jack is available for a walk in just a few minutes away. We've added trending health news, as well as a member story of the month. Once you navigate into the application, you will enter your biometric information and in exchange, receive a personalized heart health roadmap. You'll notice that the green portion denotes ideal heart health in which we are all striving for, and the red portion shows your heart health history. We belong to the fitness tech market with fitness and wearable tech being our universe, hovering around $82 billion and actively growing. We have a target market of adult fitness, 50 plus, that's approximately $450 million in size. Our competitive advantage is not only serving those individuals that are age 50 and over that are often overlooked, but our solution is conveniently dispensed through a mobile application. So no longer will you be limited to the confines of your traditional gym or fitness facility. We've also added social exercise geotags, so you can easily find your fitness contemporaries real time, which will foster and aiding that very important social health aspect. And of course, our signature heart health roadmap. While there are a number of applications that focus on blood pressure and high cholesterol, we are much more than tracking and coaching. We are a patient fitness community. One could even liken us to Amada Health, but with a social fitness bonus. Our business model is B2C with a freemium or free premium three month trial period that will introduce users to our solution that then transitions into a premium subscription that will give you ongoing access to our proprietary tools like the heart roadmap, blood pressure and cholesterol management plans, 
nutrition, and coaching. We also have future plans to offer our solution in the B2B space as a disease management tool for enterprises and institutions. Our future roadmap includes a partnership with the My Blood Pressure Lab app team. Now this app was recently created jointly between UCSF and Samsung that utilizes an optical sensor to measure an individual's blood pressure level as well as stress level. So given their complementary work, we would like to partner with them in advancing both of our missions. At month six, we will beta test with our first 100 users with a full product launch at month 12. Now, post-launch, we have plans to seek marketing and advertising opportunities with the American Heart Association as well as AARP. In terms of the WeFit team, I'm Candace. I have over nine years of healthcare experience at a prominent local carrier. Karen is our software engineer that works at a leading tech company in Silicon Valley. Keithana is our postdoc here at UCSF, and Arpit is a program manager in the gaming industry. We are supported by an advisory board of industry leaders. Special thanks to Amol Patel, who's here in the audience that works at Blue Shield. Shahid Rashid is from Clear Cost Health, and Dr. Sung is a cardiologist here at UCSF. Here at WeFit, we are the fitness alternative to drug therapy. We are a comprehensive solution for cardiac patients, and we are ongoing health management support for the mature crowd. Exercise is medicine. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I built a, a fitness app, right? And yeah. uh, I think one of the interesting things was the go-to-market strategy was one of the most important parts. What's your go-to-market strategy and how do you uh, uh, expect to find the early adopters that are going to virally spread your, your app? Well, we certainly have plans to use some social marketing um, opportunities. So, of course, um, ads, um, as well as first creating a landing page where people can just go and add their information so we can gradually build our distribution list. I've found that to provide some great support in other areas and apps. I think you should mentor her. Sure. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> what is the killer, killer feature here that is going to attract this particular demographics that you are trying to get on your app? Sure, so a lot of the other apps that we looked into often are just tracking or potentially coaching. They rarely give meaning to the numbers, so our idea is to help provide a specific and personalized roadmap, particularly for individuals that are age 50 and over. So pre-retirement, um, empty nesters, especially as they navigate that new season in life, we believe that there will be great appeal. Do you guys have plans for conducting st studies to demonstrate outcomes using the app? And really, I think m maybe fulfilling the, the phrase that you guys have of being an alternative to a drug and yes. having this be prescribed, especially with the FDA being open to that? Absolutely. In fact, um, in a previous iteration, we thought of the idea of uh, fitness prescription, right? So just like uh, therapeutic drugs, are subscribed, are prescribed, excuse me, um, why can't fitness? Any questions? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm hoping this works because we have a team in Hawaii right now who <laughs> was dying to be here uh, they are emergency medicine docs at a conference, so it sounds legit, even though it is in Maui. And uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, Christian, who was going to present, said he had nothing but Hawaiian shirts to wear, so he couldn't dress up for the event. So, <laughs> Christian, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I can uh, hear you. If you guys can hear me or see my screen, I'm not sure. I was just uh, talking with Brian. Yeah, we're good. We can see you. So this is Christian Rose from DocChain. Okay, Christian. He's got four minutes so, because he's remote. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah. Go for it. All right. I'll just start uh, talking regardless. So hi, I'm uh, Christian Rose, and along with my uh, co-founder, Callie Dove McGuire, we're two ER doctors who are using uh, blockchain to improve physician identity, starting with the problem of credentialing. So 
while I'm here at this conference and giving some uh, lectures, basically my job and training taught me how to find stuff in places it shouldn't be and then how to remove it from that. And when I went to look for my first job, um, basically what happened is they wanted to know if I knew how to remove things from the places they said that it shouldn't be and if I could do that for them. And for me, that meant actually like three hours filling out 18 different forms, for my work history, my DEA, med school, state licenses, ACLS certification, as well as a plethora of other um, responsibilities, all just to determine whether or not I was who I say I was and had those skills. Even then, once I was done with my end of it, it took the hospitals another six um, months and averaging around four months to primary source verify all of those different resources, which involves for them a lot of telephone calling, a lot of calling to state licenses, just to make sure, again, all of these things have actually checked out. Uh, and what's more, physicians who work at more than one location, which is now becoming more of the standard, some of my colleagues work at upwards of 14 different institutions, or if you work at a telemedicine suite, say as a neurologist, you might have to work at over 30 hospitals around the country and need to get credentialed at each of those. It takes a lot of time and it's kind of a ridiculously huge process. What's more, when that information is then given to the hospital, obviously they have to do something with it. So part of it is used to send off to insurer information. Some of it is used to get malpractice insurance for the physicians, to enroll them to get payments or even getting uh, and managing audits from organizations like the Joint Commission, all of which are time consuming for them. And even if they have it in one data silo, they, they still need to compile it and export it into another format. So all this winds up being a huge time sink and a big, uh, big cost. That led a lot, bunch of people, including a New England Journal of Medicine, to say that physician credentialing needs better standardization and it's just a giant mess. Furthermore, it's hugely expensive. In the administrative costs alone, physician credentialing costs about $1,600 per physician per hospital in the United States. And at UCSF alone, that meant last year they spent about $5.5 million undergoing this process, which amounts to an over $5 billion industry between hospitals and clinics across the country. And this does not take into account the even larger amount that is lost revenue by not having physicians such as emergency or neurosurgeons practice in those six months that they can't work. So obviously, if it's such a big problem, people must have been trying to fix it some way. So for the majority of hospitals we're familiar with, like your Kaisers or UCSFs, they are large enough and have enough physicians to warrant an in-house credentialing department and utilize some process management software um, or on-site database management like Credential My Doc or Silversheet to just go through the road process of recording that information and getting it into their computers. But the vast majority of hospitals are actually too small for that. And they outsource this problem to what would be credentialed credentialers who then link to clearing houses and try to pull some information from uh, third party resources while others just allow for cloud storage for year upon year ease of access of some of the physicians um, credentialing information. So. The problem with that is that in the end, you're still left with only pieces of the problem being solved. So instead of one platform or one solution to all of these, you're left with silos of information, redundancy, poor security, and difficulty sharing that from one source to the other, say the hospital to JCO or hospital to an enrollment. But it turns out that those are all perfect heuristics for a unique um, technology solution called blockchain that Although people have heard a lot about it in recent lore and it's becoming a sort of a household name, not many people actually understand what blockchain is. In the end of the day, what blockchain is, is an immutable uh, history of transactions. And for a physician, that would be something like your um, college uh, diploma, your medical school degree, and each of those going to those institutions being verified and then passed along in an immutable history of your transactions. So instead of thinking of it as all of these different things in a web, you can basically just think of it as like a physician's passport that they can then take with them anywhere they go. So looking then at this original slide that seemed really messy and complicated, that's mostly because it is. But what DocChain will ultimately do is smooth a lot of the interactions between each of the additional parties and not just the physician when he goes to get a job um, at one hospital or another. It is transitions between patient matching for um, patients with unique conditions, enrollment, finding providers, and even um, job acquisition for hospitals, which is a huge expense in the medical industry. 
And all of those wind up being um, institutions that DocChain could then partner with to provide a more seamless interaction. All of this winds up making DocChain both the most accessible and secure solution to this problem uh, across the industry. So because we're a couple of uh, emergency physicians and we have a unique experience with this, um, with this pain point, we think we're pretty well positioned to take advantage of a first mover um, in this field. So our goal is to start by working with academic institutions like UCSF and Stanford, as well as possibly Kaiser Permanente, where there's an interest not only in identifying the credentials of a physician, but also giving those credentials out and issuing them to physicians before they go off to their first job. From there, we plan to work with physician groups who staff many hospitals across multiple regions and states, followed by regional consortiums. And then we wanted to go with a hybrid approach and also um, talk to the physicians and go to them because they've actually been experiencing the most pain with this problem. So throughout all of our interviews, we found that they are just totally fed up and would like a way for newly practicing physicians to be able to take their credentials with them and quickly get their job and be ready to work from day one instead of waiting for potentially upwards of six months to get their first job or go work internationally in disaster relief or even the new burgeoning telemedicine fields or blockchain specific healthcare platforms. Um, our time timeline includes our current um, enrollment in the Frontier Innovation Awards, which is a blockchain specific uh, accelerator with our plan that we're right now working on an MVP that we hope to uh, be prepared by the end of May, at which time we're looking to secure our initial seed funding to then further smooth our app and its interface um, so that we can go with our first uh, enterprise partnership uh, by the end of uh, August or early September. So what makes us so great other than uh, what we think is a really smart, sensible product? Um, Callie and I are both emergency physicians. I have a background in informatics and information technology. Um, and we also had a wonderful group of advisors, although we're act actually actively bringing on new advisors in the blockchain and enterprise sales uh, areas, but for the purposes of the Startup 101 class, we had amazing help from Marco Smith, Robert Paul, and Nishan Pagadia, who all have worked on their own uh, startups in the past, but range also from CEOs, venture capitalists, to also um, enterprise sales managers. In the end, uh, what we have is DocChain, um, which we think is fast, secure, and transferable physician credentials. So, thank you. Thank you. Great. Have any questions? So, uh, uh, how much are you going to charge for this, and how much, how big is the market based on not how much people are spending now, but how much you can make? How much we could charge? So, depending on the approach, I think um, when we've been exploring the physician side, if you went to physician acquisition, just because that's an easy one that some people are familiar with in terms of other um, sort of the healthcare apps and things like WeFit from before, physicians said that they would spend between $500 and $1,000 for this, as some are actually charged to do their own credentialing in some places, which I had never known before the Startup 101 course. For enterprise, our initial plan is to go with that sort of freemium route, mostly because we want to be able to gain some of the leverage from UCSF and Stanford who are sending their residents out and can test this. They're also open to new technologies. But in the end, our thoughts were to basically be charging about $1,000 per position for the institutional access um, if the person wasn't already coming from there. So if you're not already, if your physician is not already paying on their own and come to you, you as an institution would pay about 1000 instead of the $1,600 price point um, for this. That's a round where we were at, but we're still obviously um, investigating that more deeply. Okay, we're going to have to stop here. Thank you for joining us from uh, beautiful Hawaii. Yeah. My <laughs> pleasure. Aloha. <laughs>
At Ugin, we want to help prevent drug overdose and help patients and providers safely manage pain. How are we going to do this? We want to improve current drug screening, which is based on immunoassays. These immunoassays have a high error rate, so up to 51%, which lead to a number of implications. The 27% false positive rate leads to medical phishing expeditions and unnecessary spending on confirmatory testing. While 24% of the time, the test results don't reflect the clinical reality that opioids are present in the patient. These results lead to false security on the part of the provider and also mean that people misusing opioids may not get the help that they need. So what is wrong with the current detection strategy? Let's say I have given a patient opioids and I would like to test for that. To create a test, I would take my compound and screen against the library of antibodies and choose one that binds well for an immunoassay. So essentially, antibodies are designed to bind a target structure within a drug class, and this presents a problem. For instance, if I have two kinds of opioids now, I would not only need my original antibody in my immunoassay, I would need a second one to bind the second molecular structure. So essentially, you need to know what you're looking for in order to generate an antibody to bind it. And if a patient has taken a substance that you don't have an antibody for, you're going to have a hard time detecting it. So antibodies are ill-suited for drug screening because the reality is that patient samples are very complex. And if you think about all the different chemical structures that we ingest every day, the idea of building a library of antibodies to bind each one is not very practical. On top of that, we don't always know what we're looking for, and this is especially true for opioids and drugs of abuse because of the new synthetics that are introduced onto the market. So what is our solution? We envisioned a drug screen that can bind to all opioids, so not only current opioids, but also future opioid derivatives and analogs. We will do this by creating a recombinant protein biosensor with a portion that binds to opioids and one that gives a signal output. And the advantage of this is that it's simple. It is a single test solution using a design with a protein that mimics human biology. This will give us uh, the ability to detect all opioids and derivatives along with creating fewer false, po or we will create fewer false positives and negatives. We also have the benefit of being easy to interpret. So instead of juggling a repertoire of antibodies and the reports, you have one platform, one class of analyte, and one report. So when the question is, are there opioids in our patient? We can provide this answer and facilitate appropriate clinical care. Now, we believe our advantages will be attractive to our customers. We've identified them through user interviews. These include workplace testing, pain management, and drug rehabilitation. Our initial target market is pain management. These providers screen not only for medical reasons, but to protect themselves and their patients from liability. How do our customers conduct drug testing today? First, a urine sample is screened against an immunoassay, and if more information is needed, it is then sent to confirmatory testing, which costs substantially more. So essentially, the immuno screen should be cheap, but if it's ineffective, this leads to more confirmatory testing, which increases the cost of testing, leads to um, you know, more turnaround time, and confirmatory testing becomes the rule rather than the exception. So this plays into our market calculation. Opioid screening is worth 500 million, Confirmatory testing, 3.5 billion for a total market of 4 billion. And the numbers we show are the numbers from today, showing that the market is growing exponentially, but so is the diagnostic burden and the deaths from opioid overdose. We want to help reverse this trend and thus bring value to our stakeholders. Some of these stakeholders may include our competitors that manufacture immunoassays. We hope to become an attractive uh, licensing target but barring that, we have a strategy that includes sales to stakeholders such as corporations, private practices, uh, specializing in pain management, hospitals, rehabilitation clinics, and reference labs, as these are places that perform drug screening. For our regulatory strategy, uh, we are a class two device, so we hope to follow a 510K pathway using current immunoassays as a predicate device. We are also very early stage, however, so we hope to have proof of concept by 2018, enter manufacturing and production in 2019, and conduct clinical trials by 2020. Now, I'm excited to introduce our team. Again, I'm Sophia. I have experience in synthetic, synthetic biology and protein engineering. 
My teammate Alex here has won a research award um, for his work. And Thanasi is a physician with over 10 years of experience in commercializing molecular diagnostics and running clinical trials that have involved over 13,000 patients. We're also especially fortunate to have a strong advising team with experience in not only developing and researching diagnostics, but commercializing them. We're especially grateful for Startup 101 um, in introducing us to Darren and Linda. So in summary, there is an opportunity to optimize screening and help patients and providers use opioids safely. The market is four billion and growing. So we have a biosensor solution that can detect multiple opioid analytes and generate an easily interpreted report. We are Yugen Diagnostics and we're excited to build a better opioid screen. Thank you very much. What other analytes could this, um, could your underlying technology detect? So we uh, have envisioned this more of a platform technology because uh, if you remember from the diagram, we had two regions on the protein. So in, um, in our hopes, you could switch out the receptor portion um, for different kinds of receptors and still have the signal output. And so uh, it's modular and gives us the ability to detect um, a range of different analytes uh, in the future. But we did want to start with opioids because we believe that there is the greatest need. How fast is the readout? Well, based on published literature, we believe that the readout should be competitive with current testing practices. As we mentioned, however, we're very early in our development, so we hope this can be answered um, through you know, increased data collection and experimentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Raj, I'm a pathologist, and uh, I'm a team leader of this team named Ecopath. So uh, in Ecopath, we are trying to change the way the cancers are diagnosed by using deep learning techniques, and uh, to be more precise and more robust. We're working on different types of cancers, uh, but for today's presentation, I'll be talking only about breast cancer. So. As we all know, breast cancer is one of the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in uh, women all over the world. And uh, that's because 70% of the cancers, uh, all the breast cancer diagnosed are invasive type. But the problem here is that 30% of that 70% are misdiagnosed by pathology. So there is a chance that the patients are undergoing over-treatment or under-treatment. So why it's happening? When a patient presents with or suspected of breast cancer, um, the biopsy is done and tissue is prepared and sent to the pathologist to look under the microscope. He or she who looks under the microscope decides the patient has a cancer or not first, and second, what's the type of cancer, whether it's invasive or not. Based on all these uh, predictions and all these analyses, the treatment is done and the management is done. So um, in a given day, a pathologist looks around 10 to 15 cases, and each case has around 15 to 20 slides. So in an average, a pathologist is looking at around 100 to 150 slides. So you can imagine if you have to look through these slides every day in and out, 100, 150 slides, your brain is exhausted. And not only that, uh, when you are telling that the patient is actually having cancer, you have to find out the, what's, uh, the in, whether it's invasive type or not, because the treatment depends on that. So there are different module or different features actually, which actually uh, features of invasive type of cancer. If I just if if you just look at this slide, and if I would not have labeled it, and I've asked you to find out what's the invasive feature, all cells look so similar. And if you imagine if uh, by end of 4 p.m. or something, pathologist is looking at this slide, he, there's a chance that he or she is missing this uh, invasive features. So overall. Um, the patient, the pathologist is overwhelmed by the load, clinical load, by the number of cases they are looking at, and uh, there is chance or like a higher chance that they, they are doing misdiagnosis under treatment or over treatment, resulting to this misdiagnosis. So what's the, what's the solution for that? In Acupad, we have developed and generated algorithms that analyze histology slides, which will identify those features, level them, and classify accordingly. The idea is to triage the samples, flag tag those um, slides for the pathologist. The, the, here is a screenshot how it will come in front uh, to a pathologist's computer where he or she will be told to focus on the more complex tissues or a complex um, uh, slides where, and so that a better diagnosis can be done in a precise manner. Furthermore, 
the current workflow of a pathology is like the slides are prepared, goes to the pathologist who grades them, and if there is an uncertainty, they do more staining as well as consult other pathologists and make the final diagnosis. So it's a huge delay or longer turnaround time. In an average, of around 45 minutes per patient, and if it is a complex case, it will be around three, uh, two to three days, depending on the IHC, this uh, protein staining. With the implementation of um, Acupath, um, um, we, 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 we have shown or we have a, um, got preliminary data that it decreases the turnaround time. And uh, which that means it not only decreases the turnaround time, but it makes the, makes the diagnosis more precise, overly increasing the laboratory output or productivity. What's the market size? It's a, anatomic pathology is a growing market. Um, but we are targeting currently the $1.6 billion market because, because of the misdiagnosis, there's a re lot of rebiopsies. So we're currently targeting this area, and if, if things go well, we are definitely focusing to go, go bigger. As a pilot study, we conducted a pilot study in three different sites. Uh, and we can clearly see here when the algorithms were applied, it has a precision of identifying those cancers uh, which have been diagnosed by pathologists more than 80 percent time. Uh, as business model, we aim to sell this uh, um, um, solution to hospitals, um, particularly um, mid-sized and large hospitals, and it will be a subscription-based model uh, where we would uh, offer a complete digital pathology solution. We are definitely aiming and willing to partner with uh, big digital pathology uh, companies. The reason is because not every hospital had a scanner, and we need a scanner for, for, uh, for our um, algorithm to be implied on. As of timeline, um, we, are, we are currently um, um, trying to conduct a bigger study with a larger cohort of patients. And we assume, uh, depending on the number of slides, you know, it will take around uh, somewhere around 15 to 20 months. Um, and then we'll submit our outcome to the regulatory bodies, which will depend on the already, because it's a, it's a there are different regulatory bodies which goes through starting from CAP to FDA. And, um, uh, and depending on that, uh, uh, we will uh, launch our product, which we seem more like around two, two and a half years to three years from now. In terms of intellectual property, we are in discussion on the of tech transfer to, uh, to protect our uh, algorithms. Uh, we plan to file a provisional application. Uh, these are our co-inventors. Co Keith Hugh is an AI specialist, and John, who is a medical oncologist, is postdoc in, this, in, in, in UCSF as well. Uh, in terms of competitors, it's fairly open field. It's a growing field. It's a fairly open field. A lot, lot of interest, definitely, because of the precision medicine coming in as well. Um, and our immediate competitors are actually both uh, PET AI and Page AI, based on uh, East Coast. Um, just to say, someone have to be in the West Coast as well. Um, so, um, um, but we are doing something definitely different from what they are doing, and we are trying to get also uh, merge the omics data on in that part, which they are not addressing here. Um, in terms of potential collaborators, as I mentioned earlier, we are definitely willing to collaborate with large digital pathology companies, where um, where we uh, uh, where we where, uh, but through which we can provide a complete uh, pathology digital pathology solution. We have a fantastic team here in Startup 101 for Chris, who is a final year med, med student. Uh, he has extensive uh, um, uh, expertise in clinical research. Tatiana, who is a radiologist uh, and uh, having main specialist in breast imaging. Obi, who is a surgical research fellow, and I have introduced this to previously. Um, in terms of summary, we have generated an algorithm using deep learning has the ability to uh, cut down the error rate to 85%. It will be a tool for pathologists. We're not trying to replace the pathologists. We're aiding them with this. We can save um, the uh, processing time to two to three days, thereby reducing the cost and increasing the productivity of the lab in general, and thereby growing and um, addressing the attractive market. So in, uh, in short, I can say one line. It is a uh, technology or it's a solution by the pathologist and for the pathologist for the development and better outcome of the can patients with cancer. Thank you. Okay, judges. The, um, with, with regard, it looks like you're developing the IP. Um, it seems to me we've seen a number of companies that are doing something similar. Do you have a strategy there or some input so far as to what's unique and different? Yeah, um, in terms of the unique, unique uh, algorithm, I cannot actually 
to be honest and disclose here. Um, uh, but uh, we are definitely, uh, what I can say that we are definitely considering what others have done and we are trying to actually uh, hit the gaps which they have not addressed there. And, and one thing I can disclose that we are trying to integrate the omics here, which includes the genomics and other proteomics data as well. Okay. So are you saying you don't have a purely tri visual training set? I mean, you're integrating other forms of data into your... So oh, also, like, um, we, we, we do have a training set, uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty early at this stage. Um, we, we are still developing it. Um, uh, and as I just mentioned, it's just, it was a pilot study with only 118 patients. We want to do it in a bigger scale, and, uh, and then only we will get a more proof of concept with that. I'm sorry, did you say 18? 118. 118, okay, that's mm -hmm. yeah. How many training samples did you need in order to build the algorithm <coughs> to do prediction on those 180? Uh, we aim um, to, uh, currently we are doing around uh, 10,000 slides. Uh, Part from from uh, for to to generate one algorithm as such and to to machine to understand, it. but we aim to do it at least thirty to thirty five thousand. Do you have a strategy to get those samples? Last question. Yep, we have collaborators in UCSF and uh, some big academic institute like OHSU, um, sent uh, in uh, Washio, Saint Louis, uh, where they will be providing us those samples, those those scanned images. Okay, it's time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Divya Chander. I'm team leader and co-founder of Lucif Lucidify, which is a platform to detect delirium, which is a brain disorder. I invite you to watch this next video with me, which will explain to you what the effect of delirium can be on a patient's mental state. I want to leave. I want leave. to leave right now. You can't right leave. Now. Where's Mary? I want Mary. Look, Mary's right there. Mary's not here. It's yes, just me. She is. She's Calm right down. There. I want to leave. You can't. I want to leave right now. Right now. We've got to see the doctor. doctor. Oh. Delirium is actually an acquired brain disorder. It is something you actually get when you go to the hospital. It has an acute onset and has a fluctuating time course. It's characterized by things like hallucinations, delusions, inattention, and disorganized thinking. Essentially, patients come to the hospital and we give them a brain disease that alters their mental status. The question is, why should you care about delirium? And the answer is this. It's an incredibly deadly disease. If you or a loved one goes to the hospital and develops delirium, the chance that you will die in the first six months after discharge goes up threefold. And it's because of these alarming statistics that it's finally begun to enter the public's consciousness. You'll see that it's actually been featured in large journals, but not just in the popular media, but in major medical journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. And this last article was just published in the last month and a half. So what does delirium actually look like in the ICU? Well, if we were to take all ICU patients, depending on the study you look at, anywhere from 30 to 80% of those patients will actually develop delirium. Now, we only diagnose 30% of them. 70% go undiagnosed. That is a terrible hit rate, especially for a disease that is so de deadly. We absolutely need to do better. So here is the time course of a patient in the ICU who develops delirium. And you'll note on this chart that the symptoms fluctuate. They wax and wane over the course of that 24 hours. Now, how do we detect it? Well, the gold standard is that the nurse who comes on shift actually goes and gives them a questionnaire, the confusion assessment method questionnaire. Now, suppose she happens to deliver it when the patient is not really experiencing symptoms of, del of delirium. You can see that delirium will be missed. So this questionnaire is episodic. It's time consuming. It takes an average of five minutes to administer the questionnaire. And the average ICU nurse has a lot of critically ill patients to watch over. It's quite subjective. So you're asking somebody who has no neurology training to actually make assessments about someone's mental status and brain state. And finally, because of all of these things, it has very low sensitivity and specificity in a real clinical setting. Here's the other thing. Look at this, created 30 years ago. We haven't developed a better diagnostic tool to detect delirium in 30 years. 
That presents an amazing opportunity for us. Our value proposition with Lucidify is to continuously and objectively monitor delirium, and when it's detected, tell the provider, intervene, and get our patients discharged more quickly. Now the question is, how much faster can we get them out? It turns out that several studies have actually indicated that for ICU patients, we can get them out six days faster. And that actually has market implications. Single patient in the United States, on average, takes up about $6,000 in the intensive care unit. That saves a hospital $36,000 for the early detection of delirium in just a single patient. Now, what do we propose to do? We have a sensor that can be applied as easily as a pulse oximeter sticker that can be applied, taken off, that provides continuous brain monitoring that is sent to our platform. Now the question is, can you actually do this? In fact, there's a lot of clinical studies that show that you can detect delirium using an electroencephalogram. So now the question becomes, why aren't we doing this right now? And the answer is this. This is the typical recording system we have, a 1020 recording system. So when a neurologist asks for an EEG, this is what you get. It takes anywhere from 25 minutes to one hour to apply all those electrodes. It's obvious that this is why we don't use the EEG as a common screening or diagnostic tool. What we aim to do is simplify this process by creating a sparse electrode array that's disposable. Our solution is to apply this to all ICU elderly patients, send this data wirelessly to the cloud, where Lucidify will analyze the data, if delirium is detected, a push notification will be sent to a provider so that they can intervene. Our IP strategy revolves around the devices we're developing, the user interface, and of course, the proprietary algorithm. Our regulatory pathway is also fairly straightforward. There are several predicate devices in this field. The most recent was awarded in January of 2018, and we aim for a 510K pathway as a class two device. Our business model involves two recurring revenue streams. The first is in the actual disposable sensor. For the average ICU stay, we anticipate a patient would go through two to three sensors. The second is in our analytics platform. We believe we can charge per patient per day $1,000, and this is actually based on existing CPT codes for continuous neuromonitoring with expert EEG interpretation. Our timeline, our milestones, we'd like to be able to go to beta launch within 18 months, and we anticipate it would take about 1.1 million to do this. And what does the delirium market look like? Well, in fact, for that first target market we told you about, the elderly patients in the ICU, it's about $2.1 billion. But when we look at all elderly patients who develop delirium in hospitals, that number increases to 13 billion. And for all patients in all U.S. hospitals, that number swells to a staggering $31 billion. Although the ICU is our first target, the second place in which delirium is most prevalent is in patients who have just recently experienced surgery. And therefore, we hope to expand into these two markets, operating room and recovery room. But because our, our technology is so simple and portable, we actually believe we could expand throughout the hospital and be used as a screening tool. In fact, one of our goals would be to take the EEG and make it a universal vital sign, much as the development of a pulse oximeter sticker in the 1980s actually made oxygen saturation a vital sign. So we have competitors in the field, but I'll point out that almost all of them are incredibly broad. They don't focus on delirium. Some of them are very expensive solutions, and we have only one real competitor in, in Europe, actually, that's focused on delirium, but they are not a portable or continuous solution. We also believe that many of our competitors could be potential partners, and in fact, if we were to partner with them, we might be able to bring our MVP to market much sooner. So this is our team. I'm a practicing anesthesiologist. I actually map states of consciousness in the operating room using an electrode array. My partners, basically we have a biomedical engineer. He's launched six products and is very familiar with FDA and regulatory cycles. And we have a neuroscientist electrophysiologist who has expertise in neural signal processing and electrode fabrication. So Lucidify, in summary, we're a platform to continuously and objectively detect deterium, delirium early in order to save lives. But I actually believe that because we are so simple and portable, we have the possibility of expanding to affect billions of patients worldwide by making the EEG a vital sign. Thank you, I hope you'll support us.
The, um, with, with the uh, simple sensor, y you're going to be trying to get equivalent readings to a regular EEG? Is that... So it's a really good question. One of the interesting things that happens is when people are conscious and active and computing information and talking, their brain is actually quite, let's say, discoordinated. You'll actually find different readings from one part of the brain versus the other. When people's states of consciousness get depressed, their brain becomes a lot more synchronous. And as I've found by measuring states of consciousness in the operating room, depressed consciousness looks the same everywhere. And that synchronicity is actually what's going to help us to de detect delirium using a sparse electrode array. Yeah, because my understanding is when people have tried to use fewer probes, with e e it's very difficult to get correct readings. To map so higher cognitive states, you're absolutely correct. In fact, it would be kind of... It would be a misrepresentation to say that you could do that for a lot of awake states. And a lot of the devices being developed on the consumer market actually suffer from that fallacy. This is because we're measuring depressed states of consciousness. So I, I didn't quite follow the, the patient path. Um, is it that somebody's at the, in the hospital, ends up in the ICU, and it's because of induced delirium by the hospital experience? And so you're getting them out of the ICU? or? What, why are, how do they get to the ICU in the first place? So these patients are typically getting to the ICU for some other reason. Maybe they had cardiac surgery, maybe they had a seizure somewhere, maybe they fell. But what's happening is they get to the ICU, you solve their initial problem, and now they develop delirium. And it's probably because these patients might have vulnerable brains to begin with. I mean, the largest hit population is the elderly. We could be unmasking dementia, we could be inducing seizures, we could be causing strokes. The problem is that so many of the problems that follow after are our fault. It's like an iatrogenic like, pulmonary infection from having someone on a ventilator for too long. And the idea is to intervene so they don't really develop this disease so we can get them out faster and keep them cognitively intact. Okay, out of time, thank you. Thanks for sticking around. So my name is Robert Blalock. I'm a professor and vice chair in the Department of Urology here at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm also co-founder of Integrum Therapeutics, where we aim to advance cancer immunotherapy in a new direction. Unfortunately, most of you, if not all of you, know someone, a family member, a friend, or a loved one that has cancer. Most of us, in addition to that, many of us in this audience right now have cancer-like cells in our body. Fortunately, we have a healthy immune system that can recognize these cancer cells and kill them. However, cancer cells can adapt. They can express a protein called PDL1 on their cell surface. This protein can then interact with another protein called PD1 on the surface of immune T cells. This results in the killing of the T cell. In this way, the cancer cell can evade the immune system and grow. Arguably, the greatest breakthrough in cancer therapeutics in the past decade has been development of antibodies to these, to these proteins. These antibodies block the interaction between the two proteins, enabling the T cell to survive and once again kill the cancer cell. The clinical response has been absolutely remarkable. Cancers that were pre previously considered incurable are now suddenly being cured. Here I show a survival curve. The purple line represents patients that are taking uh, traditional chemotherapeutics, which may extend lifespan by a few months. In contrast, inhibitors to PD-1 and PD-L1, these antibody inhibitors, can lead to long-term durable responses in a significant fraction of patients across a number of different tumors. However, it's important to note that the majority of patients are still non-responsive to this treatment. Indeed, in the best case scenarios, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, and non-small cell lung cancer, we're only seeing response rates of 20 to 32 percent. In cancers such as advanced prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, we've seen little to no response rate at all. We have evidence that this incomplete response is due to incomplete blockade of PD-1, PD-L1 function. Therefore, our therapeutic goal is to enhance this blockade and thereby reaching these patients that are currently resistant. Importantly, we have discovered a novel pathway that acts in parallel to the current therapies. Thus, small molecules that can target this pathway would have the capacity to act alone or in combination with the current therapies, vastly improving our ability to treat 
uh, patients with immunotherapeutics. As initial target, we decided to focus on prostate cancer. As I mentioned earlier, human prostate cancer uh, is resistant to current therapeutics, uh, current PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. Similarly, mouse models prostate cancer that we and many other labs use are also uh, resistant, as shown in the survival curve with the two lines overlapping. So this model, therefore, establishes a very high bar to discover new approaches to enhance uh, the PD-1, pd one inhibition and lead to improved survival. Yet, when we knocked out a single gene within our novel pathway, we can see a really dramatic increase in survival, as shown with this green line. Indeed, to this day, 40% of the mice are still alive, more than twice as long as any of the controlled no-treatment mice. Therefore, our goal is to develop small molecule inhibitors to this target, as well as other targets that we're well aware of in this pathway. A robust suppression of any of these targets is expected to lead to a similarly remarkable response. To do this, we've put together a highly experienced team, including myself and three others. I myself have over 30 years of research experience, including 12 years of running a small business called the Blalock Lab. Uh, in addition, we have three scientists who combined have over 40 years of experience, including experience in mouse modeling of cancer, uh, assay development, and big data analysis. The market opportunity is absolutely huge. Uh, advanced metastatic prostate cancer alone, these are the patients that are resistant to all current therapies, uh, equal to a number of 28,000 in the U.S. alone. If you multiply that number times the current cost of immunotherapeutics, we get a market size of $4.2 billion. But that's just the U.S., and that's just prostate cancer. We already have data showing that our therapeutic approach will be of value to other cancers as well. Uh, given the remarkable success of PD-1, PD-1 inhibition, the, the markets become very crowded. However, our approach is unique. So the majority of companies continue to focus on developing biologics, antibodies, that specifically inhibit the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction. Some forward-thinking companies, including Bristol Myers Squid and Corvus Pharmaceuticals, are developing small molecules. As many of you know, small molecules have a number of advantages. Uh, they are lower cost of production, high reproducibility in terms of manufacturing, be better, uh, better cancer penetration, and also the possibility of giving orally instead of IV. So that's all great, but still, these small molecules are aimed at specifically inhibiting PD-1, PD-1 interaction. And I've shown you that this therapeutic uh, strategy uh, has a large number of resistance, or resistance among a large number of patients. In contrast, we're also looking for a small molecule inhibitor, but we're focusing on a novel therapeutic pathway. And I've shown you that this targeted pathway can overcome resistance in a, at least a large portion of these patients, or mouse models of these patients. We are, protecti uh, we are protecting our intellectual property. We have filed a provisional patent covering the targets and the assays to measure activity of those targets. This was filed by UCSF with a priority date of March uh, 2019. Uh, our immediate uh, goals are to take these patent assays, use them to identify small molecule inhibitors, then optimize those molecules, and test their safety and efficacy in preclinical mouse models. We believe we can get this done in two years at a relatively low cost. Our uh, business model is relatively simple. We will take our lead compound and bring it through phase one and hopefully into early phase two, at which point we'll either exit or partner with pharma in order to obviously get the infrastructure and capital to bring it to market. Uh, this strategy is well supported by recent examples. Here are just uh, three examples, two of them which have exited and one of them which have uh, partnered, all at fa early phase one at high valuations. So to summarize, we have targeted a novel pathway regulating immunocheckpoint proteins that overcomes resistant to the current PD-1, PD-L1 blockade. The market uh, in the U.S. alone is $4 billion, and that's focusing specifically on metastatic prostate cancer, although we have the potential to extend to many other cancers. We have put together a UCSF team with over 80 years of combined research experience to get the job done. We hope you'll join us at Antangorum Therapeutics to find a cure to the millions of patients afflicted by cancer. Thank you.
Okay, judges. Do you have to be a combination therapy with the checkpoint inhibitor, or can you act alone, or is your efficacy alone? And do you have you demonstrated efficacy without? Yeah. So in our preclinical model, all we've done is targeted our pathway, not in combination. So okay. as far as we can tell, it will act alone, but there is a really high possibility, since it's a parallel pathway, they will act synergistically. We have just not tested that yet. So I suppose you can't reveal too much about the pathway. Is it more on the immune side or the cancer side? And if it's on the cancer side, is it a target that is just systematically sort of upregulated in the cancer? specifically prostate cancer? No, it, it's on the immune side, it, it's on the cancer immunotherapy side, and it's upstream of current PD-1, PD-1. Would it then add on to toxicities when you supposedly, if you combined it yeah. with Yeah, I mean, PD-1? all I can tell you is knockouts for some of these targets exist, and the mice, are, at least the mice, are walking around happy in cages. So you can actually knock it out and have the mouse pass through all of development and survive. Are there any biomarkers that you anticipate would stratify patients by response? Yeah, and that's a great question. And uh, I, I would say, uh, if I'm, maybe I'm not quite understanding the question, that could be, can we stratify those patients that will not respond to current antibodies and therefore would benefit from ours, or those that will benefit yeah, from for, ours, for period? Yours, for yours, is there a subset of patients, based on what you understand about the biology of this pathway, who have it upregulated? Yeah, I would say we ha yeah. We don't know. I would say, for, as far as we can tell, everybody should respond. This pathway is essential to control of this PD-1, pd one pathway, and therefore, it would be the same responders that are influenced by that immune attack of the cancer. And the responder, non-responder side, uh, I think you mentioned that this is especially useful for folks who don't respond to the current therapies, and the data you showed was a control with no therapy, and I'm curious if there's animal models that you can use for non-responders? Okay, so the model I showed you actually has been shown very nicely, published in several papers, do not respond to the current antibodies to PD-1, PD-L1, and we see a response with ours. And I'm not trying to argue that our inhibitors would act only in the situation where they're not responding to the current antibodies. It actually should act on those and more. So you've just seen um, 11 teams, 10 and a half, including Hawaii, uh, that are showing some really interesting new technologies. I, I just want to give these teams a round of applause for the great job they did presenting. Teams, I am very proud of you. You guys have come so far in 11 weeks, and we have been working intensely over the last six days since um, you won the pitch finalist. And I've just seen you progress and take coaching, and you all did a super job. So congratulations. I'm super proud. Okay, well, we have um, a fun reception outside, thanks to Wilson Sansini, so please join us. Judges, please stay with me for a few minutes so we can pick the prize winners, and uh, we look forward to seeing you out there over a glass of wine. <laughs>